Well, good morning and welcome everybody. Morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Our fellowship is through it. <laughs> uh, Tenerife being a holiday island means that most of us work in the hotel catering business. So we work shifts. Yeah. And some weekends, some Sundays we can have 30 people, some we can have 20. But what's important to me is praise God. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for Sunday. We thank you that it's the Lord's Day. We thank you that we can join together in praise and worship and adoration to you, to your most wonderful name. Father God, we ask now that you empty us of all the things and the concerns of the week, all the things and the concerns of the world, all the things and concerns that are outside that door, and just turn our eyes upon Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May we be filled with rejoicing, thankfulness and gladness and the hope that he gives the hope that he gives in, in his risen resurrection and his life may we praise him may we worship him and I pray Father God that we engage with you this morning with open minds and open hearts that you, that you fill us by your spirit that you reveal to us the depth and the truth in your word and that you lead us into a deeper and deeper relationship with yourself to you be your glory Without the name of Jesus.
Lovely. We're a small church, as you can see, a small fellowship. And um, in Spain, we get no help at all from, uh, from the government or, any, or anything. We're totally self supporting And um, so we rely upon the offerings and the gifts that, that people give to keep the doors open. And when the gifts and the offerings stop coming in, then, then the door will get closed, which means we can just continue. So um, we appreciate everything that goes in the little basket over there. <coughs> so let's give thanks to God that we have an offering. Let's give thanks to God that we're here this morning. Father God, we want to thank you and praise you that we have the ability to this work to continue, that you provide, that you sustain, that you give, that you give to us, Father God, and that in doing so, we can give just a small portion back to you. Whether that be in praise and worship or whether it be in the financial support that we need here, we just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you supernaturally multiply that offering, that we can keep the doors open, we can keep this, this little beacon in this dark place shining bright for you, that it can always be a place of hope, a place of prayer, a place of restoration, a place where your name is proclaimed and glorified in it today. As we gather around your word, I pray, Father God, that you uh, fill us by your spirit, that you open our hearts, you open our minds, you open our intellect to engage with that which you've ever said this morning. Uh, it may be me that's speaking, I may be the messenger, but you're the message, the message of Christ crucified. So, Father God, we thank you for, for this day, we thank you that we have breath in our lungs. We thank you, Father God, that we slept in the bed last night, <coughs> food in our heads, the food in our stomachs, clothes on our back. We thank you, Father God, that uh, you lead, you guide, you show the way, you provide, you sustain, that you are just as we just sung, how wonderful, how marvelous is my Savior God to you. To the glory of Jesus' name. Amen. And then we have a small offering basket over there. situation here is um, we stick to uh, expository preaching. We go through the books of the Bible one, one book at a time, one, more or less one verse at a time, or maybe two, three, if we're really being speedy. <laughs> and uh, we've just finished going through the book of Jonah, which I think has opened the eyes up of a lot of us. There's much more to Jonah than just a uh, Sunday school story. And um, but this morning, I, w I want us to look into, we've been taking the, the Lord's Supper later, we've been celebrating communion. And I thought it's an ideal time just to take a rest from the, from the books and look into a, a doctrine. And as we're taking the Lord's Supper, this one obviously became more apparent to me. So this morning, I want us to look into the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ and what it really means. So it's an expository preaching on the incarnation of Christ. So there's going to be quite a lot of scriptures, um, and if the computer keeps working, then you should be able to go <coughs> from there. And if not, you flip through your Bible, but the good thing is it's all in the New Testament. So um, as we like to be celebrating communion, this is, I think, a great opportunity, not just of importance, but why this, this doctrine is so important and often overlooked, I guess, in many churches today. It's not so much about us following a ceremony or, or a command to keep, which obviously is, is essential as believers, but it's important for us to understand the depth of what this actually all means. And the incarnation of Christ is one of the key doctrines of the Bible. So we'll take the emblems later, we'll take the bread, we'll take the cup, and I think sometimes we don't truly value their their real worth and what they really mean. We, we can get a little bit complacent, and um, especially if we've been 
in the faith for many years. It gets to kind of be a tradition. Uh, today is going to be a time just to remind us of exactly what it is. So 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, it's not on there today, so you might have to turn to it in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, this is the, the verse that's normally read out when we take communion, but we're going to, have to go through it first. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Church of Corinth, and as most of us will probably understand and know, the Church of Corinth was in a bit of a mess. So, um... There's, a, there's much more to this if we looked into it, but we're just going to go through it for what it is this morning. For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. For let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Note it says here, a, a quick side note to this, um, he broke the bread, um, but he didn't say the breaking of the bread symbolised the breaking of his body, because we know through the scripture that his body wasn't broken at the crucifixion. So sadly, the King James Version, the New King James Version, and the Amplified Version are actually incorrect when they state, this is my body which is broken for you. Other translations have it as simply given for you or simply for you. King David predicted he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken in Psalm 34, 20. And also he wrote in Psalm 22, 14, all of my bones are out of joint. And the Apostle John in 1936 states, for these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture not a bone of him shall be broken. So, it's a bit of a mistranslation when he says that his body was broken for us. It was given for us, not broken. That's an aside. Paul writes, as we've uh, just read, not to take the cup or the bread in an unworthy manner. Well, that was pertaining to the attitudes at such a time and to who it was addressed. The church in Corinth was needing restoration, it was needed to restore order. Um, but also, it's important for us because we should not partake of the bread and partake of the wine without a correct and informed understanding. So this is why this morning we're going to look into the incarnation. Incarnation is a term used by theologians to indicate that Jesus, the Son of God, took on human flesh. It is similar to the hypostatic union. Okay? Let me explain that one for you a minute. To clarify the hypostatic union, that's a phrase that's used to describe how God, the Son, Jesus Christ, took on human nature, yet remained fully God at the same time. Jesus had always been God, John 8, verse 58, John 10, verse 30. <coughs> but the incarnation of Jesus became a human being, John 1, 14. The addition of the human nature to the divine nature is Jesus or as we know him sometimes as the God-man. 100% God, 100% man. And this is the hypostatic union. Jesus Christ, one person, fully God, fully man. Jesus' two natures, human and divine, are inseparable. As Jesus will forever be the God-man, fully God and fully human, two distinct natures in one person. That's the hypostatic union. Jesus' humanity and divinity are not mixed, but are united without a loss of separate identity. So we have to be aware if we should listen or take note of such preachers as T.D. Jakes and the others who are popular these days who preach and teach modalism. Modalism means that if Jesus can only be Jesus at one point, he's not the Father, he's not the Holy Spirit. Or he can be the Holy Spirit but not the Father and the Son. Or he can be God but not the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
that's the teaching of modalism, T.D. Jakes, um, C.E. Fertig. A lot of them people teach modalism. Jesus can only be in one place as one person at one time. This totally fragments the Trinity. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a correct teaching. The word incarnation means, actually, the act of being made flesh. That's exactly what it means, and it comes from the Latin version of John 1.14, which we have in English, most of us will know, because we hear it often at Christmas. The word became flesh and made his dwelling in the mouths. The reason we use that is because it was the most exclusively used of the Latin Vulgate in the early churches and throughout the Middle Ages. And the Latin term has become a standard term for us. It translates nicely into English. And I think it translates quite nicely into other languages. It's the central part of the belief in the Trinity and its unity. And it forms the basis of our Christianity. And again, most of us know the carols we sing at Christmas. They all have such terms as the incarnate deity, uh, Christ incarnate. And we sing that many times and sometimes we may sing them carols or know them carols and not quite understand what that really means. We come across the word of them in old hymns as well, which uh, are obviously always full of good theological doctrine inside the hymns. Unfortunately, it's a term that's virtually been erased from today's modern pulpits, um, along with many other things that most of the things have been erased in modern pulpits today, such as the fact of repentance and sin in their lives. But the incarnate Christ has been mostly erased for the field of factor teachings of, of the popular preachers today in the churches that are filled with people listening to what they want to hear uh, rather than what they should be hearing. And to be honest, I don't think you see it in many new modern worship songs, which is sad and tragic. When Jesus was born, God became present on earth as a human and as the second part of the Trinity, the Son. And this is what is referred to as the incarnation of Jesus. It was when God took on human form, becoming fully God, becoming fully human at the same time. The Son of God became flesh in order to be a saviour of mankind. Now, a few months ago, we went through the book of Galatians. Remember the book of Galatians? Well, we read that in Galatians 4, chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 4. It was necessary for him to be born under the law. And we spent a week or so looking at what that meant in the law. All of us have failed to fulfill God's law. All of us. Christ came in the flesh under the law to fulfill the law on our behalf. We can read that again in Galatians 4, verse 5. And also in Matthew 5, 17. Second, it was necessary for the Saviour to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9, 22. I don't know if that's on the board, is it? No, 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 okay. Hebrews 9.22 says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So there's a necessity of shedding of the blood. A blood, sac a blood sacrifice, of course, requires a body, and a body of flesh and a body of blood, which is symbolised today and every time we take the communion. And it was God's plan for the incarnation, Hebrews 10, verse 5, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering, which is under the old covenant, you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. So it was God's plan right from the beginning. Without the incarnation, Christ could not really die, and then that means the cross is meaningless. So we remove the cross without the incarnation. So we're going to look into the scriptures, and from the scriptures we know that God speaks to us today through his spirit. He is the author. And also, only from the scriptures do we gain wisdom, do we gain understanding, and do we actually read and find the truth. Not from fallible man, such as myself, when we go through the scripture. So let's look at the biblical doctrines of the incarnation. We find first as God entering this world. We find that in John 1 verse 9. John 1 verse 9 says, That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. The better translation is actually found in the Legacy Standard Bible, where it says there was the true light which coming into the world 
enlightens everyone. It makes it much clearer, actually. But that was the true light, being Jesus, which gives light to every man coming into the world. This highlights the incarnation of Jesus Christ, which gives light to every man. Through God's sovereign power, every man has enough light to be responsible. Romans 1, verse 19 says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. <coughs> Most people <coughs> believe in something. Most people, if they're believers or not, will have to admit that there is something or someone behind the universe. Now, whether they want to choose that to be aliens or or Darwin, or whatever they want, you come out of some swamp, that's where they're wrong. But God has manifested his wonder and his life to everyone. Everyone has an inborn desire to know, where did I come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going? That is every person's question. God has sovereignly planted evidence of his existence in the very nature of man. We're the only ones that ask such questions. However much you love your cats and dogs, they don't think about that. They don't get concerned with what's happening tomorrow, and what's happening when I die. Man, we've got the soul that we've got. So by reason, the moral law, he has established his knowledge in man through general revelation. We call that general revelation. We call um, God's general grace, the fact that he allows every human being every creature to enjoy his creation. The sunrise, the sunset, the land, the food, marriage, love, children, that's his, his kindness, that's his grace. But his extended grace is only towards those who believe. But every man in every creation has a conscious of something greater. The result of the general revelation, however, does not produce salvation, but it either leads to the complete light of Jesus or produces condemnation to all those that reject the light. The coming of Jesus is the fulfillment and embodiment of the light that God has placed inside the heart of every man. This is the doctrine. Christ is the real or genuine light of humanity, and he was about to enter the world. His function would be to give the light to the truth to all whom his ministry would affect. He gives us the understanding of his word. Remember what the word says, that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the joy of salvation. We understand. Why do we understand? Because he gave us his spirit, and his spirit gives us the illumination of the word for us to understand that. Those that don't understand that haven't got the spirit. Therefore, they're not regenerate, they're not mindful of, of what it can be. They do not understand. They do not understand the way of the cross. Another part of this doctrine is what we call the word becoming flesh. Well, that famous verse in 1 John 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. While Christ as God was uncreated and eternal, the word became emphasizes Christ taking on humanity. That is the incarnation, 1 John 14. And this reality is intense because it indicates that the infinite actually became finite. That the eternal was now conformed to time. In his human body, he was conformed to time, whereas as is normal, he wasn't. The invisible, the invisible God, suddenly became visible. He walked among us. He talked among us. The supernatural one reduced himself to the natural one. Yet, in the incarnation, the Word did not cease to be God, but became God in human flesh. For example, an undiminished deity in human form was a man. And that is a key to what we believe. Unfortunately, we get what I call Hollywoodized, or TV seriesized, and we, we, we envision some sort of Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes, and, you know, hovering off the ground and never getting dirty. But we have to also realise that, that this man was, he was God. 
hundred percent God. The same God that was walking in the Garden of Eden was walking there in the streets of Jerusalem. So another part of the doctrine is descending to earth. We read this in Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Jesus' ascension from earth to heaven is where he forever reigns with his Father. So first descending, we first to Christ's incarnation. He came from heaven to earth. We sing that in the chorus, don't we, that verse sometimes. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. So he came from heaven to earth. He came from heaven as a man into the earth and even suffering unto death. So first he descended. So the lower parts of the earth are in contrast to the highest heavens to which he afterwards ascended to. The lower parts of the earth in that verse does not necessarily, as it's often taken out of context, mean to say that he was in hell. It doesn't say that. It doesn't actually imply that. The lower parts of the earth means that heaven is up so high, so he coming to earth was the lower part of the earth. Another part of the doctrine, he possessed the fullness of the divine nature in, in the human body. Colossians 2, verse 9. I said there was lots of scriptures there. Right? <laughs> Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him dwells in the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Godhead refers to deity. In fact, in the Greek, it's the word that is actually used is theotis. Theotis, we probably know, theo is God. It refers to the essence and the nature of the Godhead, not simply the divine perfections and the attributes of divinity. So the Godhead means the full Godhead. Therefore, Christ as man was not merely God-like, but was and is in the fullest sense God. Now, this is labouring the point maybe, but it's very important that we get to understand this. And when we come to the communion today and praise God in the future, that we'll remember just how deep and real this, this really needs to be in our lives. This is the reality of Christ's incarnation. Jesus was not only fully God, but fully human as well. Almost all heresy and all false churches and cults that call themselves maybe Christian even begin by some form of denial of the great central truth of the incarnation of the Son of God. They believe in other things. We know that even from the Mormons, don't we? That they believe that the Jesus is on a planet somewhere. I mean, they're on the planet, that's how he's on. We don't get there one day, apparently. So men may see the attributes of God in his creation, but they can only see his person through his son, Christ Jesus. When we read the Gospels, it all becomes apparent. He lived, he breathed, he walked, he talked. Another part of the doctrine is what we call described as self-emptying. And this is another an area where often gets misinterpreted, or taken totally out of context. So let's turn to Philippians 2, and we're going to look in verses 6 to 11. It's on the board, Jack. It's working. It's online as well. Oh, fine. Matthew's checking. Matthew's checking. Yeah, Matthew's checking. 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 But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, <coughs> the glory of God the Father. Was that not the first song we sang this morning? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Simply put then, he made himself of no reputation. He chose to set aside his divine rights. And that's an important part that we need to remember. He never ceased to be God. Joyce Meyer is a great teacher who teaches, she's not a great teacher in, in my mind, but she's a, a person that teaches that God laid aside all of his godliness of Jesus when he was crucified and then he wasn't God anymore. Kenneth Copeland teaches that Jesus laid aside all his attributes and was tormented in hell and then became born again in hell. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the scriptures, and this is where people can get it so wrong. So, Joycey and all their luck are not interpreting the word of God correctly. But they don't want to, because if they did, they would be so popular. And then we go down that route, don't we? So he chose to set aside his divine rights. He never ceased to be God. He willingly took on, he gave his life up. Remember, I lay my life down. He willingly took on the form of a servant, a human, rather than taking one of his kingly position. That's how they expected gods in them days. They expected their gods to, to, for people to bow down and worship them there and then. And they made these big things, didn't they? These big stone statues, and they bowed down before the stone statues. And that's why they had problems accepting Jesus, the God man, because he was as a son, as a servant, as a normal person. He was never emptied of who he was and who he is. That never happened. He was never not God. He was always God. And Christ did not empty himself of the form of God. He was never laid aside his deity, but of his manner his existence is equal to God constantly. And it's vital to understand this because there's also what we have an, another doctrine that comes out which is again a, a false doctrine and it's a false doctrine of what we call, or what we call the kenotic, kinetic heresy. And that is promoted today by people such as Todd White and Bill Johnson and many others. This passage does refer to the emptying, which we get the word kenosis. It's emptying found in some translations, yeah? But the Greek is kenosis. And kenosis does mean the emptying. But let's look at the text. Because in context, he says, he emptied himself by taking. Yeah? So he emptied himself by taking. He didn't empty himself full stop. This is where false teachers love to put in full stops when they preach and teach. They love to put in a full stop but it doesn't need to be a full stop. They love to put in these little things. He emptied himself by taking. That is, he didn't empty himself of anything out of himself, such as his divine attributes. Rather, he emptied himself and he did so by taking. That's what we call the mean, it was a, a subtraction by means of adding, adding to the human nature, adding to his divine nature. He added the human nature to his divine nature, not taking anything away that was divine. So Jesus came to die. So he had to add the human nature. Why? Because God cannot die. So he had to add the human nature who can die, to his God nature, who can't die, in order to die. That's the incarnation. So this addition was indeed 
And 18, since as a human being, Jesus was subject to all the things that humans are subject to, such as hunger and tiredness and temptation. Some commentaries write that Christ's action has been described as the laying aside during the incarnation of his independent use of his divine attributes. This is consistent with New Testament passages that reveal Jesus as using his divine powers and displaying his glories upon occasions, i.e. the miracles and the transfiguration, but always under the direction of the Father and the Spirit. They were never not connected. And we can get proof of that when we look into Luke 4, 14, John 5, 19, John 8, 28, and John 14, 10. It brings all that together. Externally, therefore, Christ appeared as a mere, mere human being, being outwardly considered, he was no different from the others. He looked like all the others. He was born in a nation and he looked no different than the others. There wasn't a big thing on his head like we see in some of the things. And finally we come to the doctrine that he was born according to the flesh. Romans 1 verses 3 to 4. Actually, it's also in Romans 8, 3, that we just look at Romans 1, 3 to 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Because Jesus was God in the flesh, he alone could pay the debt we owed to God. His victory over death, his victory over the grave, won the victory for everyone who put their trust in him. And the reason Jesus came as man was to die in his body for mine and your sins. He became the true mediator between God and man. Not the Pope, not the priests, not the pastor. Jesus is the mediator. We need proof of that sometimes. First Timothy two verse five. I don't know how this has been overlooked for so many centuries in some places. Like most people with scripture, they take out the parts they don't like and in the parts that do that. First Timothy 2 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Black and white. There is no one else. And further, we have from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the Lord did not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Condemned sin in the flesh is to mean that God's condemnation against sin was fully poured out on the sinless Christ. <coughs> That's why it's such a wonderful thing. Consider the incarnation, not just at Christmas time when we sing the carols, but to, to sit and know that it's all there, the nuts and bolts are all there, and the reasons why. And we can understand, we get a deeper understanding of Scripture, and we get a deeper understanding of some of the things, and, for example, taking communion, what it actually means. Jesus made his ministry on earth quite clear, and this was and is a visual display of his incarnate nature. If he hadn't been incarnate, we wouldn't have seen him. But we still be invisible. And we know, don't we, that there's even in our time, there's been other people that claim to be Jesus. And we know that there was, Jesus actually says himself, that there's going to be people saying, the Lord's here, the Lord's there. And Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus has come back twice. Mm -hmm to have missed it. But they still did it in their little watchtower and it's still in there. Maybe 
think they got the first year from 1914 was the first time, and then he came back again in 1918. We missed it the first time. That we missed it the second time as well. But that's the visual display of his incarnate nature in Christ himself. He claimed to be divine on a number of occasions. He claimed to be divine openly. He claimed to be divine subtly. And throughout the Gospels, we can, we can see. For example, he said, didn't he, in John 10, 30, the Father and I are one. He couldn't, and that's what upset the Pharisees and the scribes. So, the Father and I are one. He said that he knew Abraham because he was alive before Abraham. They didn't like that one either. John 8, 57, uh, John chapter 8, 57 to 58. And he said that people would die sinners if they did not believe in him. John 8, 22 to 24. So why did God become incarnate in Jesus? We know now that he did. Why? God's plan for our salvation come to completion through the crucifixion as well as the resurrection. And these are central events of Jesus' life. And everything else he does should be seen in the light of the cross. We are very fortunate to live in the time that we live because we have the complete book. Old and New Testament. Remember, at the time of Jesus, the New Testament wasn't written. They still have the Old Testament. In the times of the apostles, it was just coming together. But we're fortunate to have the full story. And we should treasure that. These are central events of Jesus' life. But Jesus did not only become incarnate to die for us, but he also became incarnate in order to live with us. This is, again, Emmanuel. We sing at Christmas, don't we? God with <coughs> us. So in Jesus, God took on human nature so that he could die for our sins as a fellow human, taking the penalty that we deserve, you, and they deserve. It's an amazing thing when you look into Revelation, because in Revelation 17, verse 8, it says, it explains to us that this was planned from eternity, as the names of the redeemed were already written in his book of life from the foundation of the world. Salvation. It's like God's got to sit there with a huge eraser. Oh, you've done something wrong. Rub him out. Oh, you've done something good. Put back in again. No. If your name's in there, it's in there. And it's written in his blood. He wrote your name to me, the man who put the blood. Once saved, always saved. People don't like that one either. But that's what that passage says. Otherwise, God's going to be busy ripping up pages when you get things wrong. When Jesus took on humanity, this was an addition to his divine nature, not a subtraction of his divinity. Consequently, everything he taught, he taught with authority. He was God. This is why we can speak with authority when we speak through the word, because this is God. This is why I no longer get involved in subjective preachings or things that are concerning us in the community, they change. We change. But God's word never changes. God's word is the truth and God's word is the authority. It's the final authority. So ultimately, by looking at this doctrine of the incarnation of Christ, we really get to see the depth and the length that a holy God goes to and went to in order to re-establish fellowship this creation, you and me. How wonderful, how marvelous is my Savior God to me. You saw it through the book of Jonah. And it's repeated time and time and time again. God's abundant, his agape love to us is inconceivable. Be honest. Be honest. If you was God, Thunderbolts. 
certain people. I don't think we can understand how patient he is, how long suffering he is, how loving he is, how gracious he is, how merciful he is. We can't comprehend that. But we can see it in the man Jesus. We can see it. He reaches out constantly. He forgives constantly. He provides constantly. He sustains us constantly. He guides us constantly. And after all that, he offers us salvation. After all that, there is only love for his son Christ Jesus. Amazing grace. My prayer is and my hope is, is that we're going to take communion. We should have a better and deeper understanding of every time we take bread and we drink of the cup. We should really be able to comprehend some way that the truth of the incarnation is in, this, is in the word. That we know the truth. We know the scriptures are true. One part now of that may be a little puzzle. We can go, yeah, we've, we've seen that all come together. We've seen like the owner's manual, so to speak, of how these all dots connect and why. We started with uh, 1 Corinthians verse 11, chapter 11, and in verse 22 we, we read, or verse 26, I think it was. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He's coming back again. He's not coming back as a lot of people like to think he's coming back. He's not coming back as he came the first time. He's coming back as a judge. Going back to judge the nations. And it's our job, it's our work as believers to tell us. It's not the work of the, of the church, I say, but it's the work of us as individuals to pass on the hope that we have. Don't keep it yourself. Pass on that hope. Yeah, you'll get laughed at, you'll get ridiculed, you'll get rejected, you'll get people probably hate you for it. I'm telling the truth. And I've often said it, and I'll say it again, if you're standing on the road and you have knowledge that at the end of the road the bridge has collapsed and there's a huge massive drop down a chasm, and you know that, you have the you have the truth, you have the facts, you have the knowledge, and then you see car hurtling towards you, you to stand there and watch them go past? Or would you put your own life at risk and stand in front of them and tell them the truth? Now what they do after you tell them, that's not your concern. They believe you, and they'll turn around. Hey, you know, it's cool. And the thing that's not preached up in churches today. If they continue to go on the path of destruction, you tell them the truth. We are to bear the truth, we are to be lights in the dark world, and we are to tell people of that truth that we have, the hope, the glory that we have. Pass it on. Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. You're not the Holy Spirit, right? You don't do the converting. You just speak the truth. Let the Holy Spirit do the converting. Let Him do His work. He's better at it than we are. Jesus himself, and I'm going to finish with this and I'll pass out of it. Do you want to pass it in Jesus said himself in Luke 22, verses 18 to 20. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. 
and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. You know the word communion comes from the word union. It's the result of our union with Christ. Our union with Christ, believing in and being faithful to his word. And being in that union, we also share with his death, the burial, the resurrection, and the return. And it's a foundational part of our salvation. And that death is symbolized in the ordinance of communion. Participation in communion is for all believers who are walking in fellowship with the Lord and, and with each other. It's an act of obedience in the scriptures. It's an act of worship. All of us that have a personal faith in Christ Jesus are worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. <coughs> it's a time of remembrance, a time of reflection, a time of giving thanks. However, biblically, there are people who should not take communion. We don't have an open table. It's not open to those who are not born again. Or those that are living in known and unconfessed sin. You need to deal with that first before you come to the table. And if a person has no union with Christ, then they take an act of communion. There's no significance whatsoever. A person who's not been spiritually regenerated has no means by which to commune with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, an unbeliever taking communion is practicing hypocrisy. And it may actually place that person in danger of God's judgment. First Corinthians 11, 28, 29, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let us therefore celebrate together this holy union spend a few minutes and just gathering our thoughts and examining ourselves as we're instructed to do. We have these strange little things that we've got during the pandemic. There's about 500 of them to get through. So you pull the top bit off and there's a little way to that. Okay? Something that isn't difficult for them. The non-alcoholic wine and Father, we thank you. We thank you for that human form of Christ. We thank you that he came, lived, walked, talked among us. And we thank you that this little wafer symbolizes his body. As he took the cup and gave thanks. This is new coming. Father, we thank you.
thank you for the cup. For what it means. Again, we reflect upon the teaching of today and the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ. That he came in bodily form. That he gave his body. And he also gave his blood. And we know through your scriptures that your word teaches us the significance of blood. And that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. His blood was sinless, pure. Poured out for us, sinners, unpure. The wonderful exchange. So if we take this cup, Father God, may we do it in remembrance, may we do it in thanksgiving, may we do it in worship. Praise and adoration until it comes again. Amen. Thank you.